We're continuing to work our way through the biggest DFB series of all time, so brace yourself for part two of ranking every Disney World Resort restaurant here on DFB Guide. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Blog. Today we're jumping into part two of our ranking every Disney World Resort restaurant because one video isn't gonna cover it all. We've still got one more video to go in this epic restaurant saga, so if I don't mention one of your favorite restaurants here or if there's a restaurant you're still waiting to learn more about, not to worry, there's more to come. You might also wanna check out our previous ranking videos to see if we already talked about the one you're wanting to learn more about. I think the last one is a bunch of budget restaurants, so the lowest cost restaurants. But for now, we got quite the range of resort restaurants to explore, so there's gonna be a little something for everyone here. Just remember, all these rankings are subjective, which is why we have a pros and cons list attached to each one. Wanna keep things fair after all? And what you love could be different from what we love. Now don't stress about memorizing this list, just drop us your email at disneyfoodblog.com slash resort eats, and we'll send a digital copy of everything I talk about here straight to your inbox. Let's kick this list off on a really high note, okay? We're going to Steakhouse 71 at Disney's Contemporary Resort. So I mean it, we're kicking this video off strong by starting at one of our favorite hotels for food. Steakhouse 71 was made to impress. This is a table service restaurant that replaced the wave of American flavors. And although I really did like the wave, Steakhouse 71 ended up filling that big pair of shoes very, very well. And it also doesn't look completely like a 1970s, say it with me, car dealership anymore. That's right. <laughs> looks a little bit better now. Still no windows, but it looks a little bit better. Anyway, this restaurant is themed after 1971. Not a 1970s car dealership, but the opening day of Walt Disney World. And though this is a steakhouse, you won't be able to access that full menu of steakhouse cuts until dinner time, but that doesn't mean there aren't still solid options to choose from for breakfast and lunch. I could probably live off of the bacon and eggs appetizer, which is a returning item from The Wave. And that Steakhouse 71 stack burger is every burger lover's dream come true. It's really, really good. This is one of the more affordable places to order a steak in Disney World, but that doesn't diminish the quality of the cut. And the steaks have an even better flavor when you pair them with one of the numerous dipping sauces. That's right, dipping sauce fans unite. There is a whole flight of dipping sauces here for an additional $6 which is not a bad deal for a whole bunch of sauces. Though this restaurant does require a reservation, you can always swing by the lounge for a quick bite and beverage, which I highly recommend grabbing the loaded macaroni and cheese here because it is really, really phenomenal. So the pros for this one, really, really good assortment of options for picky and adventurous eaters alike. It's really rather budget friendly for being a Disney World restaurant and the quality of what you get for the price is really excellent. Plus, this is a good one to escape the parks for a little bit. If you're in the Magic Kingdom, you can just walk over to the contemporary and dine here. I also love that the lounge is fully accessible. You can go eat in the lounge any time of day, even if you don't have a reservation and there's lots of good stuff in there in that lounge menu. You get that stack burger all day long in the lounge menu, even though it's not technically on the dinner menu in the restaurant. Now the cons here, the full steakhouse cuts menu is only available during dinner. So no big, huge selection of steaks for lunch. It's not the best if you're looking for exciting dining atmospheres. Like, you know, it's not T-Rex if your kids love dinosaurs, right? And service is quick, but leaving the parks to sit down and eat here is gonna take a good chunk of time out of your day. So I might recommend going ahead and having dinner here after a day at the park. Overall, I'm gonna give this one a 10 out of 10 though. It is an excellent restaurant. There's really not a lot to be negative about. Now headed upstairs to Chef Mickey's. Mickey and the gang are working hard to get you some breakfast and dinner. Chef Mickey's is the best type of restaurant for kids who love upbeat character dining and wanna see the Fab Five in their finest chef's apparel and also see the monorail literally go through the hotel while you're having your meal. It's very, very cool. Prices are pretty steep here, starting at $55 per adult and $36 per kid. However, breakfast is a bit cheaper at 42 per adult, 27 per kid, and still allows you to meet Mickey and friends in the same setting. So if the meet and greet aspect is the main draw for you, then consider making reservations in the morning before heading on over to Magic Kingdom. 
Pros here, it's best for those staying at the Contemporary with kiddos, lots of food for the price, and you can meet the Fab Five all at once without standing in line to meet them at the parks. Plus, they're dressed as chefs, and that's awesome. Cons on this one. Even for breakfast, those set prices are pretty steep. Also, quality is hit and miss here. You get a lot of food, but that doesn't mean all of it is going to blow you away. This is more of a quantity versus quality meal. And if you're trying to escape from the hectic chaos of Magic Kingdom and the parks for a nice, quiet meal, this is the opposite of that. It can still get very, very loud and exciting in here because the kids are meeting Mickey, and that is so exciting. Overall, I'm going to give Chef Mickey's a 6.5 out of 10, which is pretty low. I get it. But... This is kind of a one and done for me, even though I have to keep going back, <laughs> especially with a little kid. <laughs> you have to keep going back. All right. If you enjoy those energetic vibes and all you can eat food at Chef Mickey's but aren't quite sure about the character meet and greet aspect, I might just have the next best thing for you. You're going to have to take a quick boat ride to get there, though. We're going over to Disney's Wilderness Lodge. And of course, we're headed to where? Whispering Canyon Cafe. Disney's Wilderness Lodge Resort has lots of different places to eat. It's actually also one of my favorite restaurants for food. Truly, truly incredible food at Geyser Point, Territory Lounge. Artist Point is an awesome character meal that we're probably gonna talk about in the next video. But only one table service restaurant serves bottomless skillets and secondhand embarrassment. Don't be fooled, Whispering Canyon Cafe is not as quiet as its name lets on. Have you ever been to 50s Prime Time at Disney's Hollywood Studios, or at least heard me talk about it before? Whispering Canyon Cafe gives off the similar chaos vibes. No, the servers don't act like your cousins here, but they will be cooking up some fun-filled shenanigans while you're chowing down on your all-you-can-eat skillet grub, or a la carte meal if you prefer omelets, sandwiches, and nachos over heaping plates of all sorts of smoked meats and savory home-cooked sides. Be careful about asking your server for extra napkins or ketchup. You might just get more than you bargained for. I will never forget when I was younger and at Whispering Canyon with my parents when I kept ordering more and more and more Diet Coke. And finally, they brought me a giant bucket of Diet Coke along with a fast pass to the bathroom, which was hilarious. If you guys know what fast passes are, it's basically the Disney Genie Plus of yesteryear. Now, you're going to get a lot of food here, especially if you get one of those skillets. But the price you're paying for said skillets, about $24 per person, could end up being one of the better price points you'll find on property thanks to the sheer amount of food you could potentially get. Pros here, a fun alternative to character dining. You still get characters in a sense, but they're just your servers and they're really funny. And skillets provide you with a whole lot of food and could be worth the asking price if you're hungry enough. This is also best for those who love smoked meats and a lot of them, though there are plant-based options here as well. Cons, a big draw of this restaurant is the server antics. And if you're not interested in joining in on the fun or it makes you feel uncomfortable, you might not be too keen on this place. As an introvert, I sometimes have a hard time here because I really don't want to be the center of attention. Also, if you're looking for a lighter meal, keep looking because this is not it. And it's not great for those wanting a peaceful romantic atmosphere because it gets a little zany up in here. Overall, I'm going to give this one uh, 7.5 out of 10. There was a time that I would have given it an 8 or a 9, but it's just not as great as it used to be, I don't think. So I'm going to give this a 7.5. We'll keep the outdoorsy vibes going here, but maybe not in the way you were expecting. We're headed to Boma at Disney's Animal Kingdom Lodge. All right, Boma, flavors of Africa. A buffet at Animal Kingdom Lodge, AKA one of the best hotels to dine at ever. I feel like that's all I'm saying in this video is that all of these hotels are great food hotels, which they are. So I'm sorry about that, but they really are. But Boma, flavors of Africa is a marketplace inspired buffet available for breakfast and dinner. It includes both African and American inspired dishes for choosy eaters and adventurous eaters alike. Some specialties here are the Senegalese Yasa style style salmon, numerous African soups, which are incredible, the praline bread pudding with caramel sauce, also incredible, and of course the zebra dome cakes. Now keep in mind, this is a buffet we're talking about, meaning it's got those same kind of pros and cons you'll experience at other buffets, despite those different offerings. Buffets are all you care to enjoy, so you can definitely get your money's worth out of dining here if you're super hungry. But if you're not hungry, or if you're very, very much into American comfort food, then it's pretty pricey to pay $49 per adult for what you're gonna get at BOMA. If you don't wanna try some new things, eat some things you haven't eaten before, 
it may not fit the bill for you. Now, reservations also book up fast here because people love it. So make sure to book those advanced dining reservations 60 days before your trip or else you might miss out on your window of opportunity. Pros for Boma, best for those who want to try a variety of different flavors. And if you're hungry, you can get your money's worth here with all the options you have to choose from. The dessert might be worth dining here alone or the soup or both. Now cons, it's not best for those who don't need a ton of food to start or end their day with. And though there are less adventurous options featured on the buffet, you can get the same safe bet foods at way less of a price at another location. Also, it's not best for those who need something super speedy. You might be better off with the next option on the list. Overall, Boma gets a nine out of 10. Now next, we're headed over to Kidani Village to Sanaa, also in the Animal Kingdom Lodge. Now eating African and Indian cuisine, fabulous. Eating African and Indian cuisine while safari animals hang around outside the window, even better. Sanaa is a table service restaurant located in the Kidani Village section of Animal Kingdom Lodge, like I said. Many of the dishes are made with authentic cooking methods like slow roasting and tandoori oven cooking. If being able to see that safari of animals is a number one priority for you, make sure to book a reservation here for lunch and request a window view. If you make a reservation at dinner, it's gonna be harder to see those animals once the sun sets. So what foods can I recommend? Plenty, but some of my all-time faves include the Indian style bread service with your choice of five breads and all nine accompaniment dips and spreads. Please ask for extra garlic naan because it is wildly good. The salad sampler is great, the tandoori chicken. I also love, of course, the butter chicken, my very, very favorite. If you wanna try a bite or two here but don't have time to sit down and experience it, no worries. Sana also has a table service to go option which you can find on the My Disney Experience app. This is especially great if you're staying in one of the Disney Vacation Club villas there in Kandani Village because you should probably have like a dining table and you can take up your food and eat there. Pros on this one, very unique dining, which is true of basically all of Disney's Animal Kingdom dining options. And you can enjoy a meal by the Savannah or a meal on the go. And it's also best for those who enjoy a little spice with their portions. I don't mean heat necessarily, I mean spice. There's a lot of flavor going on here. Cons, not the best for choosier eaters. And if you dine here during dinner, you might miss out on seeing the animal animals as clearly as you can during lunch because once it's dark outside all you're gonna see is a reflection of you in the window which might be wonderful but not what I want to see necessarily not you me now if you're on a budget then the Mara the counter service place here at Animal Kingdom Lodge might be a better on-the-go option for you Sanaa is not super expensive but it's also not super cheap overall though Sanaa is gonna get a 9 out of 10 as well we do love the Animal Kingdom Lodge restaurants now, interested to know which restaurants you're gonna like more, the ones at Disney's Animal Kingdom Lodge or the ones at the next group of resorts? You'll have to let me know the verdict. Okay, we are headed next to Disney's Yacht and Beach Club Resort at Cape May Cafe. We are beginning. Now, this is sort of a seaside spot and the characters are returning soon, FYI. But it is pretty charming and it is peaceful, although it kind of looks outdated. It needs a refurb. Anyway, like I said, the character dining is returning soon and you can get both breakfast and dinner here. Now for dinner, it's all about surf and turf. You get the classic seafood boil with steamed clams and mussels, shrimp, corn, red potatoes. There's freshly carved roast beef at the carving station. And for an extra 29 bucks on top of the $42 prefix price, you can also get the used to be included with the price all you can eat snow crab legs. So heads up on that, if you always used to go to Cape May Cafe for the snow crab legs, now they are an extra cost on top of the regular price. If you come here during breakfast, you're gonna have less surf and turf and more of the normal breakfast buffet spread, but you'll be able to dine here for a lot less money. However, if you come here on October 4th and beyond, you'll be able to enjoy your standard waffles and eggs during Minnie's Beach Bash breakfast. Since the 2020 closures, Minnie and her friends haven't been hanging around Cape May Cafe in their beachy attire, but they're getting ready to return and soak up the sun very, very soon. Breakfast is pretty average, but at least characters are coming back. So pros, looking for a ton of seafood for dinner. This is it. Best for those traveling with a large party because this restaurant can accommodate a ton of different surf and turf preferences or waffle, egg, and bacon preferences for breakfast. And it's a fun display of dessert offerings as well. Cons here, no character dining available at the moment, but it is returning. And if you're not big on the seafood scene, don't dine here for dinner because literally you walk into the beach club lobby and you just smell the seafood. Like that's all you can smell. The snow crab is tasty, but it used to come included with that before 
buffet price. Now it's a separate cost. That's a big, big con right now for this one. Overall, I'm gonna give this a 6.5 out of 10. But when the characters come back, it's probably a 7.5 out of 10. All right, Beaches and Cream Soda Shop is next. We got those juicy burgers, those thick grilled cheese with tomato soup, lunches, and massive sundaes. Beaches and Cream is Disney's beach club resorts. Retro-themed table service with an open kitchen, an old-fashioned jukebox, and cute beachy paintings and theme overall. The full menu of comfort foods here is great. I absolutely adore this location. I come here all the time. But that being said, the food is simple. Pretty basic. Burgers and grilled cheese, but they do them pretty well. I always get the French dip when I come here. And the quality is still pretty good. It's a great option for people who want something tasty yet familiar. Now don't skip out on dessert. The No Way Jose is one of my favorite sundaes on property. It's chocolate and vanilla ice cream, peanut butter and chocolate chips, and hot fudge peanut butter sauce and whipped cream and a cherry. And if you're eating here with a group, you may want to try ordering the massive kitchen sink, which is an eight scoop ice cream sundae served up with every topping in the house. And a whole can of whipped cream, a whole can! Pros on this one, comfort food central. There's really good retro vibes here. It's just a really comfortable place to eat. And it's some of the best Sundays on property in my personal opinion. Cons here, the simple offerings might feel too ordinary for more adventurous eaters. There's probably a diner in your town that has similar food. It's also not the best place to go if you've got a dairy allergy because that ice cream grilled cheese cheeseburgers, this place can end up being dairy central and not the best if you're looking for something light. If that's the case, skip the kitchen sink entirely because even when you split that, it sits heavy in your stomach for the rest of the night. Oh, another quick pro of this one, it does stay open after the fireworks at Epcot so you can watch the fireworks at Epcot and then come over here and get a Sunday. But I do recommend getting a reservation because this place is tiny and reservations do go quickly. Overall, this gets a 9 out of 10 from me. Now we're heading over to Yacht Club for Ale and Compass Restaurant. This is sort of like gastropub meets New England comfort food, except it's like a fancy gastropub. It's not like a comfortable gastropub, right? Ale and Compass is located right off the lobby over there at Yacht Club, gives an upscale vibe while also keeping a relatively family-friendly atmosphere. So this one does a lot of things right. It's got good food for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's got good service. It's even got an open kitchen where you can watch the Disney chefs whip up your meal. But that said, I will say it's always available for a reservation. I don't think people go here very often. I personally don't choose it all that often because even though the food's fine, there's nothing really drawing me here. I mean, they have a really good bread service here. It's delicious, but is it worth going all the way over to Yacht Club for? Not really. Now, that said, if you're planning on sticking around your hotel one day and maybe hitting up Stormalong Bay while you're at it, Ale and Compass can be a solid choice that's going to provide pretty decent eats like that bread service, it's Parker House Rolls with some spreads, and the Bacon and Vermont Cheddar Burger, Warm Apple Cobbler. See, it's all good words! And the prices are decent, so why don't people love this place? I don't know, it just doesn't grab us. Pros, keeping it classy and family friendly. It's an approachable menu of solid eats for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And you walk away full, but not necessarily broke. That's all good. Cons, it's not best for those looking for an over the top Disney experience. The theming is pretty muted here. And the food is good, but not necessarily unique enough for more adventurous eaters. It's not gonna be destination worthy, not something you're gonna remember for the rest of your life. And it's also not best for those looking for a quick meal before popping back over to Epcot. This is a long table service meal. Overall, I'm gonna give this one a 6.5 out of 10. Now you don't have to venture too far from Yacht and Beach Club to access even more restaurants. So we're headed over to Disney's Boardwalk Inn to Trattoria Al Forno. Now Boardwalk Inn isn't always my personal favorite place to grab a meal, but I'm willing to give these table service restaurants a chance to prove me wrong. If you're in the mood for some original Italian dishes, like handmade cavatelli, which I gotta say is really good, but it kind of looks like little worms and I don't know how to feel about that. But there are also seasonal risottos, yay, I love wet rice, you know that, and shrimp pappardelle. Trattoria Al Forno is also gonna let you slurp up your spaghetti in a very welcoming dining room with warm, rich colors and expansive wood paneling. There's lots and lots of wine as well. Now, a lot of you might remember this was the original location of Spoodles and then it changed to Cuisina and then we got to Trattoria Al Forno. So there's been a lot of tenants in this particular space. The dining room is still very similar. Again, it feels like a big 
old sort of wooden barn, but it's very high class anyway. Now, Trattoria Al Forno has a huge open kitchen smack dab in the middle of the restaurant, meaning you don't have to miss a second of your dinner preparation, especially if you have a front row view. Though the restaurant serves both breakfast and dinner, breakfast isn't quite the selling point it used to be. Don't get me wrong, quality of breakfast food hasn't gotten worse or anything, but the experience here used to feature a rather unique character meet and greet with Disney power couples like Rapunzel and Flynn Rider and Ariel and Prince Eric. Alas and alack, the couples haven't returned since the 2020 closures, but we'll let you know if anything does change, especially with all the upcoming boardwalk renovations about to happen in the not so distant future, like as in now. Pros on this one, it's great for those looking for hearty plates of Italian food, and it's a nice balance between fancy dining and a more cozy vibe. It's fun to watch the Disney chefs whip up something real nice, and don't forget there is Mickey-shaped pizza here for the kids, and I think it's one of the only places on property you can get that. Cons, no big breakfast character dining right now, which is too bad, and if you had a big meal for lunch, you might want to skip having another big meal here. Big portions also equal pretty big prices. This is not a cheap restaurant, but it's not a signature restaurant. Overall, this gets a 7 out of 10. Okay, going over to Big River Grill and Brewing Works next. Listen up, all you brewery fans out there. Big River Grill and Brewing Works is a real live brewing factory with a rotating list of seasonal beers on tap. While you enjoy a cold one, you can munch on classic pub eats like burgers and club sandwiches and different shareables for the table. My personal favorite are the brewery nachos. I also really, really like the cheddar cheese soup here. Now, if you're not already strolling around the boardwalk, I wouldn't say you need to step out of your day in Epcot to experience this place. It's a decent place to swing by if you really want a casual beer and some greasy bar food, but this place does not have the best food ever. And I will be honest with you, the menu literally hasn't changed for like 10 years. It's the same menu. So this is not my favorite place. It's not great value for your money. It's mostly here to serve all of the convention guests over at Swan and Dolphin and at the boardwalk, so it's just not putting its best foot forward. Pros on this one, it's good for those who are desperate for a microbrewery experience because they do brew their own beers here, y'all, and also those shareable pub snacks. And if you're staying at the boardwalk and want to eat somewhere close by without eating directly in one of the parks, then here you go. Those nachos and beer cheese soup are delicious as well cons you got a brewery pub back home then you've basically been here already and if you're not already in the boardwalk area it's not worth the extra trip to track down looking for romantic vibes or even kid-centric vibes keep looking overall i'm going to give this one probably a five out of ten it's one of my least favorite restaurants in disney world now i'm not gonna lie this next hotel has served me some pretty disappointing entrees time and again i usually go more in depth with my feelings about them in the dfb guide to walt disney world dining which you can find on the dfb FB store website if you're interested in learning more. But listen up during this section anyways, because a table service restaurant here might be your key to getting a last minute dining reservation, not to mention a very affordable one. Okay, let's head over to Disney's Caribbean Beach Resort to Sebastian's Bistro next. So let's say you want an all-you-can-eat meal, but you're on a budget. So where do you go? One option is Sebastian's Bistro at Disney's Caribbean Beach Resort. So Sebastian's Bistro serves Caribbean and Latin-inspired cuisines for dinner, including main dishes like oven-roasted citrus chicken, slow-cooked mojo pork with mango sambal, and grilled flank steak. Now, if you're close to the Caribbean Beach Resort, or if you're staying there in general, we've been able to find last-minute reservations for Sebastian's like 95% of the time. But really the big selling point of this place is the flat rate. Dinner pricing is $29 per adult and $17 per kid. So if you're all about getting a good quantity of food for a decent price, Sebastian can make that happen. But as far as quality is concerned, this isn't the best food, but it's not the worst either. This restaurant is definitely better than it was back when it was Shutters. And if you're a huge fan of Caribbean flavors, do you see how well I'm doing saying Caribbean instead of Caribbean? because I always say Caribbean when I'm talking about Caribbean beach, then this restaurant might really wind up being your jam. So pros, best for those who want a lot of food but are still sticking to a budget. Always seems to have last minute reservations, so real easy to eat there. And it's a convenient meal if you're staying at Caribbean Beach and don't want to travel too far to eat. Cons, though it's not the worst for picky eaters, there are definitely more adventurous and slightly spicy options that some might not enjoy. And remember, this is a family style meal, so you kind of all get the same food. For some reason, coconut shrimp is considered an enhancement here and costs an extra $8. That's another major con. It's kind of bizarre that it's not included. And atmosphere is nice and beachy, but not exactly super memorable. This is not a destination restaurant, y'all, but this is a good one if you're already staying at Caribbean Beach and you're doing a resort day. Overall, six out of 10. 
Now, this is not my favorite moderate resort to dine at, but you know which moderate resort is my favorite to dine at? This next one. Disney's Coronado Springs Resort. So we're going to talk about Toledo, which of course has a subtitle of Tapas Steak and Seafood. And when it comes to resort dining, Coronado Springs has gotten impressive. Has it always been impressive? Absolutely not, my friends. But since they built the tower and they added three bridges, you've got Toledo, you've got Dahlia Lounge up there, Barcelona Lounge, lots of good stuff going on here now. Sitting on the 15th floor of Coronado Springs Grand Casino Tower is an avant-garde restaurant with great views and a variety of Spanish-inspired small plates. Toledo is one of those date night, kid-friendly, casual restaurants. So it really serves all purposes. Now, many of these offerings are made to share. So if you want to keep things more affordable, you can order a couple of different options off the tapas and starters menu, like the charcuterie and cheese board, the Spaniard for two, or the Rioja braised chorizo. Or you can go all out, try the chef's signature dinner for two for 145 bucks, which is going to get you two of the signature shareables, two bone-in ribeyes with your choice of two sides, and the Toledo Tapas Bar Dessert, which is a single dessert bar with four different flavors, Spanish coffee, crunchy chocolate, raspberry mousse, and lemon curd. I know, sounds weird, right? Now, kiddos have a nice diverse menu here too, but it may not be the best for eaters who prefer, you know, pepperoni pizza and chicken tenders. But kids will probably get a huge kick out of these window views. Toledo is an unsung restaurant when it comes to fireworks views across Disney World. So since this place is only open for dinner, stick around and catch that show. If you or someone in your travel party is kind of iffy about heights though, those giant windows do look very, very, very far down. So even though you're totally safe, you don't have to sit near the giant windows. But if that's a factor that'll make you uneasy your entire meal, you may want to dine somewhere on lower ground. Pros on this one, best for those looking to split a meal, but still keep it classy with a capital C. And are you a charcuterie fan? Come here ASAP. A signature meal minus the signature price is the real draw of this location, which of course is the draw of this whole hotel. A deluxe resort feel minus the deluxe resort price, but only if you stay in the tower. Cons, not best for picky kiddos who want standard theme park food. That's not what's on this kid's menu. And those 15th story views are gorgeous, but can be intimidating if you have a fear of heights. And of course, it's only open for dinner. Toledo is gonna get an eight out of a 10 on our book. Moving on to Three Bridges Bar and Grill at Villa Del Lago. So you might be dining high in the sky over at Toledo, but you'll be dining over the water at Three Bridges Bar and Grill. Three Bridges has a casual open air vibe with stellar views of Lago Dorado, especially if you're seated next to the water, but it also has upscale Spanish inspired cuisine. Think high class bar food. So instead of fried chicken wings and greasy burgers, you're getting options like house made guacamole, braised pork tacos, and still burgers, but not like hockey puck burgers. These are nice, fresh options with manchango cheese, roasted garlic lemon aioli, arugula, and tomato. Now my absolute all-time favorite spreadable, dippable, shareable item to order here is the warm manchango cheese and Oaxaca cheese dip. This comes with a heaping plate of tortilla chips. And Three Bridges is also known for their house-made sangrias. They even offer a sangria university class, which is a separate experience from the restaurant itself, that'll let you whip up a fancy little sangria of your own. You can make reservations for this experience on the Disney World website. Three Bridges does not currently take reservations, so dining here is first come, first serves, kind of like Geyser Point over at Wilderness Lodge. You need to join the walk-up waitlist on the My Disney Experience app sometime after the restaurant opens for the day, which is usually around 4.30 p.m., and until midnight. Pros on this one, beautiful lakeside views, fresh flavors and unique options for adventurous eaters. And of course that warm manchango cheese dip and the sangria flight, which is served beautifully and is delicious. Cons are that there's no reservations really, except those walk up waitlist reservations. So depending on when you get on the online waitlist, you might find yourself waiting a bit before your group is called. And the menus are a bit more limited for kiddos here as well. Another potential issue is that this is outdoors. It is covered, but it's outdoors, which means if it's 110 degrees in Orlando, it may not be the most comfortable place to dine. Or on the flip side, if it's 50 degrees in Orlando, it may not be the most comfortable place to dine either. But overall, I'm going to give this one an 8.5 out of 10. I think it's really an incredible location that a lot of people have no idea is even there. Also at 
Coronado Springs, we're talking about Rick's Sports Bar and Grill. Have you ever stepped inside a restaurant and gone, oh man, I wish this place had 31 TVs that were all playing a big sports ball game? And if you answered yes, then Rick's Sports Bar and Grill is the place for you. This is a table service restaurant that does offer the bar food spread, like nachos, fried mozzarella sticks, and burgers galore. But to be fair, those also aren't hockey puck burgers. They've got a nice little variety there. Now, I'm all about the nacho life, which is why I like Rick's unique take on its traditional appetizers. Friends, I would like you to meet Wachos, otherwise known as crispy waffle fries loaded with house blend queso blanco, bacon, and scallions. Of course, you've also got a wide variety of different cocktails, wines, and beers to order from, so City Works better watch its back. And if you're wanting to try a really different dessert, many of the DFB team love the cotton candy cheesecake, but some of us think it's way too sweet, so heads up on that. Pros on this one. Best for those who want to keep up with the big game in Disney World while also enjoying an app and a beer. And if you're staying at Coronado Springs, it's nice to have another decent option within walking distance of your room for a table service meal. And of course, those wachos, you're not going to find them anywhere else, and they are pretty good. Cons, even if the pub food is good, it's still pub food, so nothing too out of the ordinary here, and this place is not necessarily atmosphere galore. It's pretty boring to dine here. There are 31 TVs, and if that's going to bother you and your group, then don't come here, and if you're not staying at Coronado Springs, this is really out of the way and not worth the journey, so not a destination place. Mostly this is here if you're starving and you're staying at Coronado. Overall, I'm going to give this one a 6.5 out of 10. Now, Maya Grill is next, and this one's really difficult for me because it's kind of all over the board when it comes to consistency and quality. This is a Mexican restaurant, and here they're going to surround you with Mayan motifs of fire and sun and water, and they celebrate the taste of Nuevo Latino with hearty options like empanada de barbacoa, chicken enchiladas, and a queso fundido burger because more cheese. While there are some really noteworthy options here, like the surprisingly delicious fried baby churros with dulce de leche ice cream cream and caramel sauce. This is probably one of my least favorite places to eat at at Coronado Springs. But you know, the bar is set pretty high with Toledo and with Three Bridges. It's not super different from a Mexican inspired restaurant you'd find just about anywhere. And the prices are still pretty steep, ranging between $20 and $36 per entree. This is owned and run by the same folks who run the Mexican restaurants in the Mexico Pavilion in Epcot. And those are hit or miss consistency wise as well. That being said, Maya Grill is tucked out of the way and often times forgotten about, so you can usually find a last minute reservation here if you're needing a nice sit down meal with no stress attached. Pros here, really good churros and easy to walk up and score a table. Again, if you're already staying at Coronado, you don't have to travel too far to get here, but it's not going to be a destination location. Cons, it is very far out of the way. There are lots better Spanish inspired options, not just at Coronado Springs, but at Disney World in general, and not best for those on a budget or who want to budget in one really nice meal because this one might be disappointing. Overall, six out of 10. All right, told you Coronado Springs could hook us up. And remember how I told you that you don't have to memorize all the restaurants on this list if you drop us your email at disneyfoodblog.com slash resort eats, because that's looking real nice right about now. Now, word of warning for this next group of resort restaurants. Some of them don't want you to dine there right now, so hopefully this resort doesn't hurt your feelings. We are headed to Disney's Grand Floridian Resort and Spa and starting at the Grand Floridian Cafe. In a place like Disney's Grand Flow, filled with high-end experience after high-end experience, it's refreshing to see a little cafe that's not cheap per se, but is more affordable and still manages to keep the fancy Victorian air about it. This place is not full of itself. They serve really, really good quality food and their prices aren't off the radar. So here you can get breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And by the way, daily brunch options are served until 2 p.m. Seasonal soups here are top notch, especially that chilled strawberry soup that's very reminiscent of a smooth, a fruity smoothie. And yes, those of you who are long time Disney World devotees know that the chilled strawberry soup is of course from 1900 Park Fair, but every once in a while you can find it over here at Grand Floridian Cafe. Now we're also big fans of the avocado toast and the eggs benedict option but one of our favorite options here is the Lobster Thermidor Burger, which is an artisanal seven ounce burger patty with lobster Parmesan Thermidor sauce on a seared brioche bun. And of course, my all time favorite option here, 
at Grand Floridian Cafe is the chicken and waffles, which you can order a Mickey waffle with it. Doesn't usually come with a Mickey waffle, but you can substitute it. And that comes with like a hot honey thing going on, which is absolutely phenomenal. Definitely, definitely worth going off your diet for that one. Now, the Grand Floridian Cafe is within walking distance of the Magic Kingdom. So if you need to escape the parks for a bit, you'll more than likely be able to score a reservation here. And you might even be able to walk in if you plan a late lunch or early dinner. Pros on Grand Flow Cafe, a nice, elegant escape from the madness that can be Magic Kingdom midday. It's best for brunch fans who want to fill up on toasts and benedicts and chicken and waffles. And it's a more affordable sit-down alternative to the other Grand Floridian dining options. Cons on this one, the elevated flavors here add for a nice spin on traditional options, but can be a bit much for choosier eaters. And don't get me wrong, this place can still rack up quite the bill. So if you're on a budget, maybe choose someplace else. Escaping Magic Kingdom to eat here will take a giant chunk out of your park day, especially if you walk over instead of take the monorail. So just a heads up on that. Oh, and for those of you who are saying, you can also take the boat here, AJ. Yes, you absolutely can. I just don't know which one's faster, the boat from Magic Kingdom or the monorail from Magic Kingdom all the way over to Grand Floridian. So place your bets in the comments. Overall though, this is gonna get a nine out of 10 for me. I absolutely love this restaurant. Next is 1900 Park Fair. Now you know how I said Grand Floridian has a couple restaurants that are not gonna give you a warm welcome right now? This is one of them. 1900 Park Fair is still temporarily unavailable with no opening date on the horizon. But we're gonna talk about it briefly anyway because you wanna be ready when it does open. 1900 Park Fair is was a character dining buffet style restaurant where you had your group meet Mary Poppins, Alice in Wonderland, the Mad Hatter, and Pooh Bear for breakfast, and Cinderella and her crew came out for dinner. And when we say crew, we mean crew. It was Prince Charming was there, Lady Tremaine, the stepsisters, it was everybody. Now, the options here have been pretty standard in the past. Think basic buffet food offerings like pizza, pasta, chicken wings. So the real draw has always been getting a chance to meet those rare Disney characters. Keep checking back with us to learn more about the future of this character buffet, because I'll make sure to update you as soon as I learn some more. Pros on this one, great for those who want to meet a lot of rare characters at once, and it's good for those who love all-you-can-eat buffets. Nothing super stand out here except for that strawberry soup we just talked about. Cons, very typical options. Not a lot to write home about like I just said and not a big fan of character dining then investing in this restaurant is not going to be worth your while. Overall 1900 Park Fair, 7 out of 10. One more Grand Floridian experience that hasn't yet returned but we're keeping on the lookout for is the afternoon tea at Grand Floridian's Garden View Tea Room. It's exactly what it sounds like. If you and your group wanted to get together for a spot of British inspired afternoon teas as well as enjoy some finger sandwiches and a selection of assorted pastries this is where you did it afternoon tea was offered from noon to 4 p.m daily so when they say afternoon they mean afternoon not a second longer and the garden view tea room is was a nice place to try something different and special and celebrate an occasion in the process Pros on this one, very cute, fancy afternoon escape to have a tea party. And the price wasn't too shabby, especially for the amount of different treats and teas you actually wound up getting. Cons here, it's a very short window of opportunity to experience this. And reservations could be hard to come by. But overall, afternoon tea at the Grand Flow, 8 out of 10. Now remember, the Cake Bake Shop is opening over on Disney's Boardwalk in 2023. They will absolutely have afternoon tea there as well. So if the Grand Floridian Tea Room does not reopen by then, you can always try that place for afternoon tea. All right, this next resort tends to get overlooked when it comes to good eats, but let me give you a word of advice. You need to stop overlooking it, especially if you're looking for a good time for your whole travel group. We're going to Disney's Old Key West Resort to Olivia's Cafe. Disney's Old Key West takes you off to the Florida Keys to a place called Olivia's Cafe. Olivia's Cafe is one of those chillax table service restaurants that serves classic American dishes like burgers, club sandwiches, and southernmost buttermilk chicken. You're going to find a lot of citrusy elements incorporated into the food here, like the shrimp fritters with key lime mustard, the crab cake with the griddled pineapple salsa, and the key lime pie for dessert, one of my absolute favorite key lime pies. These are comfort foods to the max, so expect approachable options and yummy foods 
foods that make you do a little happy dance after each bite, which I'm sure you do, and I would like to see video of it. And for all you brunch fans, you'll be happy to know that starting September 1st, which is my birthday, you'll be able to order brunch as a daily offering. Hooray for even more opportunities to order that sweet, sweet banana bread, French toast, and savory spam cheddar biscuits. Pros on this one, it's a coastal cracker barrel, but like better. And starting in September, you're gonna be able to get brunch there again. Very approachable options here, great for picky eaters and not so picky eaters alike. Cons on this one, this is another one of those restaurants that's kind of out of the way from everything else. Not best for those looking for romantic tones, definitely beachy family vibes through and through here. And you're not gonna have the most adventurous options here either, but the choices that you do have are unique flavors that might satisfy your adventurous spirit otherwise. Overall, Olivia's Cafe, eight out of 10. All right, give me a second to collect my bearings for this next resort and rest restaurant because if I'm not careful, I might just start talking about this place for the rest of the video. If you already know what restaurant I'm talking about, I'm proud of you for knowing me so well. We're going to Disney's Polynesian Village Resort. Of course, we're going to Ohana next. Disney's Polynesian Village Resort is the place to go if you want tropical foods and Hawaiian style entrees, but my favorite here is Ohana. Hands down, it holds my heart. Ohana is an all you can eat dinner feast with grilled meats and Hawaiian specialty sides, which are good special sides, but the star of the show is always going to be the Ohana noodles. And if you think the savory stuff is good, just wait till you've had the Ohana bread pudding. Look, I know you're going to be tempted to fill up on those endless noodles, wood fired grilled teriyaki beef, spicy peel and eat shrimp, but at least save a little bit of room for this a la mode masterpiece drizzled in warm caramel sauce. Breakfast is served here too, but not just any breakfast character breakfast, including rare meet and greet opportunities with Lilo, Stitch, and Hawaiian Mickey. Much like Cape May Cafe, character dining hasn't been available at Ohana since the parks had their 2020 closures, but starting on September 27th, you can say aloha to your favorite blue Disney alien once again, or second favorite blue Disney alien if you're a big Gonzo fan. Is Gonzo an alien? I don't know. Let's talk to Bria about that. She's a big Stitch fan though. That being said, if you want to eat at Ohana for cheaper, you're looking at only paying $25 per adult for breakfast instead of $55 per adult for dinner. But then again, dinner has Ohana noodles and bread pudding, so you know, gotta pick your battles. Now, here's a little tip for you. If you don't want to spend $55 for dinner, head over to Tambu Lounge, which is out in the lobby of Polynesian Village Resort after 4 p.m. and you can get noodles and bread pudding there for, well, not that cheap, but a little bit cheaper than $55. Now, whether you eat here for breakfast or dinner, expect a lot of food piled onto your plate. If you're looking to eat a lighter meal, this is far from that, so come here hungry. It's also important to note that select seats at Ohana will offer fireworks views of Disney Enchantment over in Magic Kingdom, and the nighttime spectacular soundtrack will be piped throughout the entire restaurant as well. You can always ask the host up front for a fireworks viewing seat while checking in for your reservation, but that never means it's guaranteed a seat in that preferred section. But you might as well ask and see what happens. Pros on this one, the price might be steep, but you're gonna get a lot of high quality food out of it. You can also eat here for cheaper in the morning and enjoy a spread of island style breakfast options. It's a truly unique sighting too. The place is sure to leave an impression. Cons on this one, reservations are hard to snag, so make sure you try to make an advanced dining reservation 60 days out. Fireworks can be a perk depending on where you're seated, but you're not always guaranteed that fireworks for you, and it's very, very expensive. Tasty but expensive. I'm gonna give Ohana a 10 out of 10. I know it has its negatives. I get it. Sometimes the meat is dry. Sometimes not everything's perfect. Sometimes you don't get your Diet Coke filled as quickly as you'd want to. I know, but I'm still gonna go back every time. So there we go. All right, now I hate to be the restaurant that has to follow Ohana. So how do you think our next resort restaurant is gonna be able to compare? Is it gonna fall flat? Let's find out. We are going to Disney's Port Orleans Resort Riverside to Boat Rides Dining Hall. A lot of you don't even know this place exists, right? Don't worry, we're gonna solve that problem right now. Disney's Port Orleans Resort has one table service restaurant to rule them all. And by all, I mean both the Riverside section and the French Quarter section of the hotel. And Boat Rides is themed to look like a restored boat construction warehouse. And when you take a look at that menu, you're gonna find a boatload of Southern Louisiana favorites like jambalaya, shrimp and grits, and Mardi Gras fritters. 
What's a Mardi Gras fritter, you might ask? Great question. It's house-made pimento cheese fritters with pepper jelly. And if you've got a true Southerner's heart in you, you are probably sold as soon as I said the words pimento cheese. If you're looking over all the entrees and can't decide what you want to eat, you don't have to. For $35, you can order the all-you-care-to-enjoy chef's platter and get an assortment of ribs, Nashville hot chicken, smoked sausage, barbecued beef brisket, mashed potatoes, mac and cheese, roasted corn, and Cajun butter, and green beans. Not a bad deal. Boat Rights is only open for dinner, but even with the limited hours, you'll still probably be able to find a reservation for this restaurant on the day of your visit. One thing I do want to warn you about, however, is how incredibly close the tables are to each other here. Sometimes I'm lifting my fork and I'm like, I'm going to elbow the gentleman to the table next to me. So yeah, if you're looking for some more elbow room, you might want to hop on a boat and try one of the restaurants over at Disney Springs instead, which yes, Disney Springs is only a boat ride away from the Port Orleans Resorts. So pros on this one, you can definitely get your money's worth from the all you care to enjoy chef's platter. Lots of Southern foods for you to enjoy. And I really, really like this restaurant. I'm gonna put this in the pros section because I've always really liked this restaurant. I think it's a good, not well-traveled, not very well-known, kind of underrated spot, but I know a lot of you do not like it. So (laughs) please let us know in the comments your experiences. It's also nice to have the option to get an all-you-can-eat or an a la carte entree. It's nice to have those choices. And it's great for those looking for a casual atmosphere with comfort food aplenty. Cons, close quarters. You might find the neighboring group seated a little too close to your group in the dining room. Also, this is pretty far out. Again, if you're not staying at this hotel or if you're not at Disney Springs and literally don't want to go to any of those restaurants, which I can't imagine why you wouldn't want to, you can take a boat over here. But it's definitely not a destination restaurant for most people. And there's lots of flavors and spice here, which is not a bad thing unless you're not a fan of bold tastes and a slightly sizzling tongue. Overall, this is going to be a 7 out of 10. All right, since we're already in the Disney Springs area, why don't we check out one of the more overlooked restaurants in that area? See if its table service restaurant winds up being a diamond in the rough. We're going to Disney Saratoga Springs Resort and Spa to the Turf Club Bar and Grill. Disney Saratoga Springs doesn't get a whole lot of love, especially when it comes to its limited dining options. But even if you're not planning on staying at this hotel, you should know about the Turf Club Bar and Grill. Why? Well, three important reasons. One, if you're a straight up carnivore, you're gonna love this place. Between the grilled filet mignon, braised lamb tagliatelle, crispy boneless chicken, and several other hearty options that feature fish, pork, and steak, you'll definitely find something to eat here. Reason number two, it'll give you a nice break from the parks. You're not gonna find over the top Disney characters or theming here, which might be just the escape you're looking for. And reason number three, the service is pretty good here. We always seem to have really attentive wait staff, which is really nice. So if you need a place to dine without all the extra hoopla, the Turf Club Bar and Grill could be your little hidden oasis. That said, the food isn't overwhelmingly great, and again, it's a pretty far trek for most folks. If you're already at Disney Springs, why would you leave to go to this restaurant when there's so many good ones there? So pros on this one, carnivores unite, and the portions are relatively plentiful, so you get a lot of bang for your buck without it being an all-you-can-eat location. Cons on this one, kids might get kind of bored here and start asking about where all the, you know, colors and characters and Disney went. And the acoustics are kind of strange. They make it feel like it's louder than it actually is. If you're more of a plant-based eater or if you're just looking for lighter options in general, I can't say I'd recommend this one to you. Overall, this is going to be a 6.5 out of 10 for me. All right, we started off this video on a high note and we're ending it with a bang. Just see for yourself. We're headed to Trails End Restaurant at Disney's Fort Wilderness Resort. You might not think Disney's Fort Wilderness Resort would have some of the best eats, but don't underestimate it. Trails End Restaurant, for example, covers all three B's of dining that guarantee a great meal, barbecue, bread, and banana pudding in a mason jar. Okay, if you want to throw in breakfast into the list, you can do that too, since Trails End does offer both breakfast and dinner for their family-style meals. And while breakfast comes to your table and features a standard selection of breakfast classics, dinner serves up shareable skillet filled with pecan smoked brisket, smoked chicken, pulled pork, pork, roast potatoes, green beans, and buttered corn on the cob. Don't worry all you plant-eating families out there. There's also a plant-based version of this all-you-care-to-enjoy spread that you can order instead. And don't forget to pick up one of the specialty cocktails here. It's not every day you can order a moonshine margarita or a gully wumper, which is a fruity moonshine drink that's as fun to say as it is to drink. 
Pros on Trails End, great for those staying at Fort Wilderness and looking to eat a whole lot of food in one setting. All you care to enjoy a meal where you can really get your money's worth. This is one of the less expensive table service restaurants in Disney World right now, and it's good food. Tasty barbecue, moonshine cocktails, combination of champions. Cons on this one, this restaurant's gonna be really far out of your way if you're not planning on camping out here. And if you already got barbecue at one of the other numerous barbecue places featured in Disney World, then you probably don't need to make the extra trek to eat here. Also, this is a lot of food. So if you're already full, you may wanna eat at one of the quick service locations around here instead. Overall though, eight out of 10. And hoop de doo musical review. It is back, my friends. It's finally back. This is the restaurant that provides ample amounts of both food and entertainment. As you're busy passing around buckets of all-you-can-eat fried chicken and ribs and mashed potatoes and heapings of other comfort foods, you'll also get to enjoy multiple performances throughout the night thanks to the Pioneer Hall players and their endlessly entertaining songs, dances, and quick-witted jokes. Hoop de doo is a standout restaurant that you will not forget anytime soon. There are people that literally come here every single year and have been doing so for like 30 years, 40 years, etc. There are three different pricing categories here that you need to know about, and they depend on where your table is in reference to the stage. Prices range between $66 and $74 per adult, which can seem steep, but remember you're not only getting an all-you-can-eat meal, you're also getting a show and unlimited draft beer, wine, and sangria if you're 21 years or older, which is a real nice surprise. There are three showtimes daily, except for Mondays and Tuesdays currently, so make sure you book this one 60 days out so you can guarantee your seat for the classic Disney dinner show of the ages. Pros on this one, dinner and a show, count me in. Wait, and unlimited beers, wines, and sangrias? Now it's a party. The energy at this place is unmatched. It's such a fun time and we're happy to have it back. Cons, if you're wanting something more low key, this is definitely not the restaurant you're looking for because everything is very loud and very in your face. Also, if you're someone who'd rather watch a show than be a part of it, look out because performers do come into the audience to dance and sing along with the entire dining room and you may have the spotlight on you for a little bit. And also this is expensive, so you may feel more comfortable investing in a restaurant with eats that are a little less traditional. Another note on this one, again, it's at Fort Wilderness. It is very far out from all of the parks, all of the hotels. It can be a trek to get to, and it can be a trek to get back to your hotel or back to where you're staying. So keep in mind that if you're going to go to Hoop De Doo, it's basically gonna take several hours out of your Disney day. Overall, we're gonna give Hoop De Doo, what can I say? It's a 10 out of 10. Okay, I am dying to know which restaurants are you stoked to learn more about in our very last Disney restaurant rankings video of this series that's coming soon. Let me know and make sure you're all caught up on the other rankings videos so you can be a serious completionist. And that means you get the highest honors for sure. Thanks for listening, everybody, and thanks for watching. You made it through this whole video. I'm so proud of you. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Vlog, and we'll see you real soon.